It's one of the questions of our times. What is identity and who can define it clearly? The latest focus is on the estimated 650,000 members of the trans community and their right to say who they are. The government's been consulting on amending the law that enables trans people to change their legal gender. At the moment, someone must be over 18, have been diagnosed with gender dysphoria by two medics and have proof they've lived in their acquired gender for two years before they can get a gender recognition certificate which allows them to change their birth certificate. Many want the process made easier. I, I'm in a situation now where my passport correctly says female but my birth certificate still incorrectly lists me, lists me as male. I want this inaccuracy between two pieces of government ID corrected. It all comes down to self-identification of your gender rather than needing others to approve it. But there are those who disagree. This week, campaigners briefed around 20 MPs on their views. One MP there said his staff had advised him not to attend as the subject was too controversial. It's certainly become a toxic debate, which leaves some fearful of saying and others offended by hearing views like this. To open up a category, um, the category of female, which underpins women's rights, let's face it, to open that up to biological males, for whatever reason, um, of course will impact and worry females. The campaign has told Newsnight changing the Gender Recognition Act on the back of other developments in trans rights could undermine equality legislation for women, compromise female-only spaces like women's refuges and have a detrimental impact on young people as they explore their identity. Nobody wants trans people to be discriminated against. The difficulty has been that we are painted as transphobic if we actually just raise the issues of how does this impact on women and how does it impact on children. Are you transphobic? I'm completely not. I'm absolutely um, detest any form of bigotry. You don't believe trans women are women? Trans women are not women. Women are adult uh, females. If the dictionary definition of the word woman is transphobic, or the idea that can women have a penis is transphobic, then that really has no meaning anymore. This view goes against the liberal tide, and many trans people would call it hate speech. Amy Challoner came out as trans four years ago. She's been approved but is still waiting for surgery. Many trans people never have it. But the precise numbers are just one example of how difficult this debate is. One group who oppose changing the law claim as of 2015 only 5% of trans people had sought medical treatment. Trans campaigners we spoke to wouldn't confirm this. Amy says the number would be higher if more resources were available. But the key thing for the trans community and others is that surgery is irrelevant. It's about how you identify. Do you understand why people, viewers of Newsnight, might be surprised to hear that? They might be surprised to hear that if you've got a penis, you're a woman. Well, I mean, because of historical education and we actually, you know, some people in historical civil rights may have been surprised or shocked to discover actually we, we have the same basic human rights and dignity but because we've seen it when it comes to gay men in the 70s and 80s we've seen it in the 50s and 60s with people of colour we actually need to start thinking trans women are women get over it trans men are men get over it for some, Amy herself is a controversial figure. She accused the Greens of transphobia after the party suspended her. She'd allowed her father to act as her election agent after he was charged with criminal offences. She later apologised for that decision. We wanted to have more trans people in this report and we did approach others who share Amy's views. We found many told us they will not appear in an item in which the views of people they see as transphobic are also broadcast. The emergence of trans rights does pose new questions for society on everything from who can appear on all women shortlists to whether trans men and women should be allowed to compete in sport in their affirmed gender. This philosophy professor is deemed transphobic by some because she questions whether biological males can be women. People think I should be sacked, they think I make uh, this campus an unsafe space for trans people, I'm happy to say I absolutely do not. Um, this is an issue about law. We are being invited to consult on the law and 
someone of my point of view, whether or not you agree with it, has a perfect right to say what I'm saying. People Professor Stock's concerned that changing the law on self-identification could undermine feminism's hard-won gains, but also from an academic standpoint that all arguments should be open to criticism and evaluation. There's no other criteria for counting as a woman except that you self-identify as one. We're already going down the route of moving away from expertise, away from visible, observable, scientific, recordable facts towards um, strong feelings being the arbiter of what is the case. Um, and we can see that in a range of areas, not just in this debate. It doesn't seem to me to be a good route to take. We're opting out of a harmful debate, out of a harmful narrative, because it does no good to our mental health our lived experiences, our lives and our human rights. These debates raise fundamental questions for society about who we are, what we can observe and what we can talk about. The government consultation ends tomorrow, but the conversations will go on far longer. Katie Razzle, I'm joined now by a group representing some of the many diverse views that will be informing the ongoing consultation. Debbie Hayton is a physics teacher who writes about trans rights issues. Ruth Sorotka co-founded the group A Woman's Place, which argues for women's rights. Helen Belcher is from Trans Media Watch. And Daniel Mastardi writes for Diva magazine. Hello to all of you. Uh, first of all, Helen Belcher, as you see it, what is wrong with the system? Firstly, it's very costly. You yeah. have to apply for medical reports, which can be very time consuming and costly to get. Secondly, it's an opaque process. It's not accountable to anybody. Now, explain and there's no what you right mean about appeal. that. In terms of opacity, if you submit a whole bunch of paperwork mm -hmm. to a panel and you never meet the panel, then the panel makes a decision based on the paperwork in front of them as to whether you satisfy some arbitrary criteria that they have about whether you meet what it is to be a man or a woman. And that's not appealable by you? or no. any. You can appeal on process, but given that the panel meets in secret, you don't know what the process is. So on the, on the very basic sort of just rules of justice, it fails on those rules. So did you even go into the process? Did you even begin the process? Um, I wasn't able to go into it in 2004 when mm -hmm. the process came because I, I'm still married. Mm -hmm. uh, I was married then and we decided actually the route we had was either to get amicably divorced or have our marriage annulled. And we thought actually an annulment of our marriage was mm -hmm. a bit of an insult. Uh, when the law changed around same-sex marriage in 2012, my wife uh, actually really objects to being asked to give consent. Yes. And I don't want to put her through that position. But does it disadvantage you at all not having the certificate? It disadvantages me in terms of always being slightly unsure about whether the paperwork is going to be found out. Yeah. So, you know, if you tick F on an HMRC form, mm. is that actually challengeable? Am I committing an offence? And yet it feels completely wrong to tick the M box on that. Um, what, what do you make of that? Well, like, like Helen, I don't have a gender recognition certificate. I don't see, personally, I don't see the need for one. Mm. Uh, the gender recognition certificate would allow me to marry in, target, in, in my preferred gender, mm -hmm. but I'm already married. Uh, it also affords some privacy as well. This is the issue about, in some ways, about the panel meeting in secret, because the whole process is there to protect the privacy of the individual. But the, I suppose what your argument would be is that because you've got no idea, there may be criteria mm -hmm. for that panel, but because you don't have any locus, you've no idea it's secret, that they can make a decision about you or someone else, and you would have no idea why they made the decision one way or the other. Well, they, can, they make a decision based upon the paperwork which you submit to so them. So you think it's a good thing? The, the, there needs to be some way of checking to see whether the paperwork which is submitted mm. is, uh, is valid. But what do you make of the idea that you shouldn't really have to, you, could, you should self-identify in the sense that why should you go through all that and actually face a financial penalty for the way that you identify? Well, the, the issue, the, the, there is the issue of the £140, yeah. but uh, this is a government process and uh, people applying for uh, citizenship mm -hmm. or naturalisation are used to paying much more than that. Personally, I see, I see arguments to actually reduce that cost, actually. You know, the, the, the cost itself is is an arbitrary figure which was set and it could be well be reduced. But, but as an act, as it stands, you don't object to it? 
in terms in terms of the gender recognition act yeah. there are I, I have serious issues with parts of it mm -hmm. so for example that the gender recognition act re requires you to live in live in target gender for yeah. two a period of two years yeah. But you, you, have, you, you have an issue with self-identification. Yes, it's, the, uh, it's not just self-identifying your gender, it's changing your legal sex. And that changes your relationship with society. And in doing so, when you change your legal sex, you then inherit the rights and protections mm -hmm. which have been afforded to another group. And that is quite remarkable. You, but you have a problem with that. I mean, you feel that's unfair. No, I don't think it's unfair at all. What I, do, what I do think is that to do that then has an impact on the other group whose rights that we, as trans women, transitioning, then inherit. Daniel, what do you think of that? Um, I mean, I, I write for Diva magazine, um, and we're a magazine for, for lesbian and bi women. Yeah. Um, and ever since the conversation um, kind of really came to a fore a few years ago, we've always kind of been unequivocal in our stance. Um, that we we are for lesbian and bi women, and that's cis and trans women alike. Um, for us, there's really there's, there's not a question. We are one community, and we see that reflected in our readers as well. Um, for example, with the London Pride, um, when the, the, there were some protests um, then, and we, we did a response, and we um, we used the hashtag L with the T, which I think most people here will be familiar with. Um, to say that we For do. For those who aren't, do tell us. Um, so L with the T is just saying that the, the lesbian bi uh, community stand together mm -hmm. with trans women mm -hmm. um, as one community. Um, well, but Ruth, you you wouldn't agree with that. No, I don't agree. I don't agree with that. Um, I mean, the first thing I want to say is that it's clear that protections in law should exist, and so um, Women's Place, myself, everyone who works with us, believe that all. Uh, trans women and trans people should have rights that are not, uh, you know, to not be discriminated against, not face any forms of harassment or intimidation, and to be able to live their lives. The, the debate I think that we are trying to have is about whether or not there is a conflict between the rights of women and trans women. And I think, as Debbie has said, that what is being proposed is not just a simple tidying up of an administrative process is quite a fundamental change that has potentially got massive impact on women's rights. So if anybody can self-identify into the category of woman, um, which is uh, understood in law as well as a dictionary definition as an adult female, then um, that actually undermines all kinds of rights that women have and that have been underpinned by equality law for many years. Helen. Well, I mean, firstly, it's not just trans women. We're talking about trans men being able to identify as men. Secondly, the definition of woman was set by the Gender Recognition Act in 2004. You don't need surgery in order to do that. Um, the Equality Act is what protects the same-sex, single-sex spaces. Uh, the government has said it's not intending to amend the Equality Act. Um, and the, the idea that a man would try to acquire a gender recognition certificate in order to go into a woman's space, it wouldn't, it wouldn't offer the man any legal protection whatsoever. And most of these kind of crimes, I understand, are not premeditated. And so actually, if a man was to do that, that would be evidence of an even worse offence. But just before we go on, and we will talk about the whole idea of these women-only spaces that, mm -hmm. you, that I think is, is part of what, you, what, yeah. what your issue is. David, the, the whole, do, you, do you make any distinction at all between transsexual and transgender? Uh, transsexual, the, the, the whole terminology is, uh, is the ter terminology is very difficult. Yeah. But transsexual usually implies somebody who has made a meaningful a meaningful gender transition, which often involves hormone therapy mm. and sometimes involves surgery. But it's the idea of a meaningful gender transition, whereas transgender is a very, very broad term, yes. which it covers an, a huge group of people. But, but presumably people that, who are transgender would say that they have made a meaningful conscious decision on identity themselves. They just haven't been through the surgery. Well, transsexual people don't necessarily go through the surgery, but it's, it's making that meaningful yeah. transition. There are transgender people who make no meaningful transition at all. 
that so would let's mean, so come back to what that actually means yeah. in terms of women's safe spaces, if it means anything at all, that well, distinction. Well, the, the, the transgender um, bandwidth, in a, in a sense, has become so mm. broad, it can actually include people who um, identify as a woman on one day and, a, and they are a man another day. So people like Philip Bunce, who recently won an award for being um, a, a business award for being a woman in business, actually goes to work some days as male and some days as female. And that, for, for the, the consequences of that on women's rights or understanding you know, how women are progressing mm. in business or how they're progressing in public life, that is clearly massively undermining to women um, that, that that kind of um, pretense can you, go on yeah, really. The, the, what you're what essentially saying is that is a that is a pretense that is you know, making the, the, making that decision of 24 hours by 24 hours would you do you think she's got a point I think I think a, a lot of the discussion has been kind of lost in the these two polarized kind of it's as if there's two sides of the community and one saying this is this and this is this is this whereas I just feel that you know the most important thing is gender is gender is such an emotional and such a personal thing you know um, and no more so than for for trans or non-binary or intersex people and I just feel to stand in the way of them being able to to self-identify and to live authentically and and, and, and happily um, isn't is is the issue that no. we should be. You, Helen, you, you alluded to you know, issues, for example, the issue in a prison where there, there was a, you know, a massive problem. But kind of just on that question of now addressing the whole question of women's safe spaces, it's fair to say that women's refuges welcome transgender people uh, because they see that not necessarily as any kind of threat. And yet you think that is a problem. Um, I, I, I do. I, I think that that's not reading the situation correctly, if I'm honest. I mean, there has been for many years now quite a chilling effect on the women's sector from the insistence on in what's known as inclusion, mm. uh, including funders saying to the women's sector that they won't fund unless they're inclusive. So that you see that that is a self-fulfilling prophecy. A lot of um, uh, policies, therefore, become inclusive of trans mm -hmm. women into women's safe spaces. I mean, we we are trying to assert the feminist idea, um, which has existed in law for a long time, that women should be allowed therapeutic and private spaces when they are the victims of male violence. Um, and you know, we get a, a, a strong echo for that. And, and I know a lot of women's organisations that we work with are saying that that's what they want to re-establish. That but, but presumably, right that. transgender, transgender women have also been victims. Of male violence. Yeah, and so we're not saying that um, anybody who's been a victim of male violence, whether that's a trans woman or a woman, should not have support. What we're saying is that there should be third spaces, tertiary spaces, and the trans movement, instead of demanding of women that they give over resources, that they actually um, do begin to have this discussion with and the you, women's and you movement agree with that. about how we have additional funding yeah, yeah. and politicians need to take that on board but as well. But do, do you agree with that, that there should well, be this third space? The question comes down to the, bound, the women's boundaries. Who, who controls those boundaries? Is it women or is it anybody who decides to identify as a woman? And what do you think? I think it has to be women. I think the, there are two issues there. The first one is about the separation of spaces. That's, that yeah. smacks of segregation completely. Um, and we've had a disability access act in place you know for building ramps and, and mm -hmm. things for wheelchair users for example that really hasn't happened so the idea that there would be uh, funding for separate spaces for trans people is that I really can't see that gaining any level of political capital the second and would you want it anyway Emma? no no because, part of, because my identity mm -hmm. is as a woman mm -hmm. and so um, and the other the other thing I would say is that the whole debate because it is a debate rather than a discussion, and that, that saddens me a lot. But the whole debate is, is positioning trans women as women like me, who transitioned in middle age. Okay. Whereas you've got a, a generation of youngsters coming through who will not have any um, sort of teenage or, or adult experience of being the gender they were assigned at birth. And it works both ways. It's not just trans women in the middle of this. This is intersex people yeah. and non-binary mm, people and trans men in this. Ruth. Yeah, I just want to pick up on a couple of points there. Firstly, 
gender is not assigned at birth, sex is recorded at birth. So that, that, that's a big mantra of uh, the transgender movement that I think we need to, um, to, to challenge. But secondly, I want to say that there is an absolute need for sex segregated spaces. I mean, even if you don't accept it in um, some places, there is a fundamental need for those spaces in prisons, where we, women are very vulnerable, uh, and in sports. I mean, these are big areas of life where women are at a massive disadvantage if men can self-identify into those spaces and surely Helen you can see that. But the Gender Recognition Act has nothing whatsoever to do with that, that's a Equality Act and that has already exemptions. And do you agree with the exemption for example in sport? Well uh, that's up to the sports bodies, I'm, not, I, I'm not, not exactly a sporting person as you might be able to tell, um, <laughs> but there are certain issues around certain sports mm -hmm. where uh, some physical advantage may um, sort of count but there are lots of sports where it doesn't and actually a lot of sports say well after you've been on some medication for a year or two those kind of physical advantages are gone why are we going to start legislating against you know if you're six foot three then you can't enter a sprint race for example i'm afraid we have to leave it there fascinating discussion thank you very much indeed